Revelation 19. We are swiftly rounding out the end of the age of man and into the heavenly realm, heavenly kingdom, new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem, the final group of the first resurrection. We are, we are winding this magnificent book of Revelation up. And chronologically, if we were transported to where this is at now, we would be done. We would be wrapping up um, history, um, the earth as we know it, and moving into the um, beautiful thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth as his saints are ruling and reigning with him and um, allowing the Jews to have a, a beautiful thousand-year time on the earth where they're not oppressed by other nations. And they have the great blessing of being like God's people and to bless them during this time would brings blessings from the Lord Jesus. So anyway, we're getting to Revelation in its twilight or new beginning, uh, because as it ends, there's like the new, the new beginning. I don't want to say new creation because creation was finished, but this is going to be the transformation of creation as God would have had it, but he had to create a testing ground um, for us, for mankind, right? Um, because what makes a man a man or a woman a woman is the choices you make. So when your wonderful creator puts you on this earth, gives you life, breathes into you, now are you ready to be thankful to your creator God, to allowing you to have breath and life and movement on this earth? So he gives all of us the right to choose. And that's a beautiful thing. It's like when you're married, do you want somebody else to tell you who your spouse is going to be? You want to choose, right, who you love. And first off, the best thing to do before you start down a human trail like that is to respond to the one who loved you first. And that's Jesus Christ, our creator. He loved us first. And so the very first step in this universe, in this creation, is as he reaches out to you, that we reach back and we connect and say, thank you, Jesus, for creating us, number one. Number two, for dying on the cross for our sins because we are all sinners at one point in time in our life. And we need salvation, every single one of us. We need repentance, not only in a born again conversion, whether it's at two years old or five years old or 15 years old or at 50 years old. We need a born again conversion and then we have to live a life of repentance, continually turning away from things in this life, lawless, immoral, sin, continually turning away a life of repentance and faith and hope in Jesus Christ. Okay. <laughs> I caught myself there. I was going down that road and we were going to have a we are going to have a, a, a hallelujah time. <laughs> We're going to get to our text here. Revelation 19. And after these things, I heard a great voice of many people in heaven sing, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great harlot, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. This world in which we live in the year 2016, that I'm giving this from the Bears Gym, the earth is reeling 
from the sins of fornication. The pornographic industry, both in the literature and the movies and the, the music that instills adultery and sensuality and fornication outside of marriage. Where we have the homo movement, the rainbow boys and girls, the poodle club and all that. They have defiled our world. And somehow this great harlot is involved in all this, this great city, um, feminist, idolatrous, immoral movement has gone back to the, from the, to the dawn of man, to Adam and Eve. Somehow, some way. Can't really understand it, but that is the gist that we get here. Well, obviously because it was Satan-backed, and who defiled Eve? Satan, right? You know, when he was at a little different state, possibly than the serpent, probably a, a beautiful, angelic, dragony thing before he was cursed and hit the ground as like a snaky thing. And then Eve defiled Adam because she submitted to Satan and then she handed the, the fruit of whatever kind to Adam and he gave in to it. So somehow this spiritual movement goes back to that time and God has finally judged the great harlot. And again they said hallelujah and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying amen and hallelujah. As kind of a flashback to the first few chapters of Revelation when we talked about pictures of the church or saints in heaven. We, we see in the multitudes where the saints have blended in to the brethren and the fellow worshipers of Jesus Christ. And, and yes, that's where the body of Christ is, both Jew and Gentile. Another picture, and you could say it's also a combo picture, and frequently in the Bible we have combo effects, right? You know, in the Old Testament prophecies we have combination fulfillments. We see David prophesying in the Psalms where God crushed his enemies, and we also see that as referring to Christ in the future, right? And it's a combo where Christ's enemies are crushed. There's a combo. So we hear a combo picture. We see the angelic multitudes where the saints are all part of the great brethren and the worshipers of God. We also see the 24 elders. A lot of good men, a lot of good teachers, which I'm not really one of them, so I'm not including myself and in the great men. I'm just a dumb bear, but I'm presenting to you the word of God the best I can. And in my opinion, it is a, like a combo effect. But it doesn't really have to be. It's just a beautiful picture of something magnificent in the heavens. You can go either way with that. Some very good men believe that is a combo package of the church being in heaven. And we see that immediately right off the bat in the third heaven, the third realm, the heavenly realm, the realm where our heavenly father Yahweh and Jesus Christ um, dwell. And so that's the 24 elders. And so we're going to see the other multitudes kind of comboing up for the great uh, effort here. So we're going to get moving because we have a lot to cover. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants. That's all the servants. Those that were before Christ, before the new covenant that God had given to Israel, the old covenant, new covenant, pre-diluvian, just all the saints, those that were in paradise, where Christ was there preaching the gospel to them. The good paradise, not the, because there was two compartments in, in Hades, the good one and the bad one. The bad ones, we'll see them regurgitated up um, in a little while here, chronologically.
And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. So everybody. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Sometimes when we hear the voices of many waters, it's also representative of many peoples. And so and when it, uh, previously when we were talking about the great harlot and she sits on many waters frequently, she sits on, she influences many peoples over many waters, many people groups, could be, or a combo effect once again. And they're praising the Lord both our Heavenly Father Yahweh and the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, as a combo pack, right? Except that our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit are a tri-pack. You know, that's kind of, I guess that's a good way of putting it. It's a, a triune package. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. That's us. You know, men, women, everybody that are in Christ. And that's kind of the picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We are kind of like the bride, and we're marrying the groom. And the groom is the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are like all part of that beautiful spiritual marriage. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Kind of interesting, isn't it? That the angelic being of whatever sort this person is refers to himself as a fellow servant of our Father God, Yahweh, and the Lord Jesus. He is a fellow servant. He is of our brethren. See, we're part of that same angelic multitude of the saints and the brethren and the worshipers of, of God. But John was overtaken by all this. He, he knows that. I know that. I know not to worship man. You know, I, you know in, in the, the cataclysmic church, people are dropping down it as they leave to kiss the Pope's ring as they're, they're heading out. Everybody's kissing his ring. I've had people grab my hand trying to kiss my ring, and I say, don't do that. But people kind of get worked up. You know, you share them the good word of God, and they get moved spiritually, emotionally, and they want to do something, kiss your hand, your finger, you know, whatever. But the angel did the right thing, and we need to make sure we do the right thing. Say, well, don't, don't give me any adoration. Give your adoration to where it belongs, to the Lord Jesus Christ, unto the Father. So John kind of was overwhelmed by this all. He dropped down, he went a rotoflex in front of this angel, and the angel said, stop. Don't do that. You worship God, not me. I'm just a fellow worshiper of God myself. Basically is what he said. Verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The Lord Jesus is merciful. You know, the little nursery rhymes. You know, um, little Jesus, meek and mild, and little lamb, little lammy pie in the cradle and all that. But you know, Jesus is also... also the guy that made a whip and drove the hypocrites, the false brethren, out of the temple of God and, and took their tables and flipped them over and kicked them nasty things out of the temple of God. He does that too. He's still doing it, little by little. In true churches, we find the little wolves, big wolves, male wolves, female wolves, all kinds of wolves. Because God cares for his church. 
He cares for purity in the church more than your numbers multiplying. And once your church gets into the focus of multiplying for the sake of financial income coming in, you're, you're pretty much done. You're done. Your, your candlestick is just a, a past memory. You're just a corporation making money, and that's your, your thrust. And when money and income and multitudes and numbers are your primary directive, you've lost the focus of what it means to be a church of Jesus Christ. Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. So that's kind of cool. He has his own little name. I got my own little name, except I tell it to you. I kind of go by bear paw. It's kind of my handle, and you can call me that. I have a legal name that my mother and father gave me, and that's on my birth certificate, records, and so forth. But kind of my handle is bear paw, and I'm going to tell you my name. You know, it's not that big of a secret, you know. So, so you can raise your, your paws and say, hello, bear paw. But, because uh, bears don't have thumbs, right? They, we just have paws, furry paws. Real bears. Verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Kind of beautiful how words can transport the message of our Savior, of our Creator, to our heart and to our mind. And sometimes people can read these words, but they don't really act on them. They don't change what they're doing. They don't allow the Word of God to change them and cause them to have acts of faith and repentance in their life, to stop the sin and to get out and perform acts of righteousness, holiness, purity. But the word is written, but it's also alive by the Holy Spirit of God. And when you respond to that, Jesus Christ is speaking to you literally. It's beautiful. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now who did we just say that was clothed in fine linen? All the saints, all these people, all this multitude clothed in fine linen. We're going to go down there and we're going to fight with the Lord and we're going to rule and reign with him with a rod of iron. And I'm not a big horsey guy, but this time around we'll be riding white horses coming down with our Savior and it'll be a good time. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Right now you kind of have kind of free choice, you know, whether you're going to respect our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus and give credence to the Word of God, to the church, to Israel even. But there's going to be a time when it's not just, you know, you can choose and, you know, like we say now, we can, you know, everybody's life matters in their own eyes. During this time, it will be a, a forced rule of righteousness. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Jesus can made it out. He can put the he can put the, the he can put the big hammer down, the meal mirror, the Thor hammer, the Odin hammer, except the real one the real one from our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, the, the hammer that smashes, that crushes. The one that if you trip on, it will destroy you. And the one that if it falls on you, it will destroy you because he is the sovereign one. We are never sovereign. It's his decisions that control us. And when we submit ourselves to that, we find it has an eternal love, and blessing of being in fellowship with our Creator. That's kind of a beautiful thing when you think as looking up at the stars. Let's say look up at the stars. Go out tonight, you know, if you, maybe you got opportunity to go out and look at the stars. Go out and look at the stars. Say to yourself, He who created all this wants to know me personally 
demonstrate his love for me, talk to me, have fellowship with me, and spend eternity with me. When you think about that, it makes you think twice about getting involved in sin, adultery, fornication, drunkenness, lying, cheating, stealing. It makes you think twice of being involved in that garbage. It makes you think about practicing righteousness and walking the road that he has put before us that is narrow, that's going against the current of the world. The current of the world is wide and washing everything downstream. The follower of Christ, however, turns against that stream in a very narrow path upstream. And that's the way of our Heavenly Father, against the grain, for the glory and purpose of God Almighty. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, that song we've probably sung that little ditty, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, glory, hallelujah. If you haven't sung that in your church, do so soon. Go talk to your song leader. It's awesome. You can have people pop up on one side or the other. And who, who's the loudest? You know, gets their cheer really loud. They're, they're the winners. You know, and you can do a bear a bear clap. It's kind of a fun song. You know, where you sing it in the round. That's a very fun song. Okay. Nothing like being in a big congregation with a bunch of bears stomping and laughing and clapping and having a ball singing that song. Just, just saying. It's a very fun song. Verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. The Gospels, it talks about men being taken from two men in a bed, two women gathering, you know, and by the well and all that stuff they're gathering away and where they... Where the body is there, there shall the carnivores, the eagles, the condors, the vulture, birdie things. They're going to come and they're going to gorge on dead warriors that have fought to oppose God. Can you imagine that, gathering together great armies to fight against God? You think your bombs and your bullets and your drones and your nuclear warheads are going to stop God? No, he's going to smear you. He's going to smear you. And all these birds are going to get big and fat by gorging on the bodies of the men that opposed God. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Let's see how long this battle takes. Okay, There's probably millions, very possibly 200 million, possibly in this scenario. Maybe more, maybe less. Let's see how long the, bat the beast and this Armies are going to fight against the Lord. Let's see how long it lasts. Okay, that was the end of the verse. It tells us they're gathered here. Here's the next verse. And the beast was taken. Boom, battle over. First we see him, and then boom, battle over. That didn't take very long, did it? And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So the beast and the false prophet are the first sole occupants of uh, outer darkness, the lake that burns forever and ever and ever. So these, these guys are like the first and only occupants of the lake of fire. Good riddance to them. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, 
and all the fowls of the air were filled with their flesh. So, the battle didn't last too long. And you know what? They deserve it. Little man, you oppose God, you're going to go down. And it'll be quick and easy because he's God. You don't oppose God. Fight against God, push some buttons and launch some missiles at God, shoot some arrows and bullets, 50 cals, 20 millimeters. What's that going to do? Nothing. It, it doesn't even tell us. It goes from one verse of there they are to boom, they're being taken captive. It's over. You can't oppose God. And also in the spiritual realm right now, you think you're opposing God by hating him because your life hasn't turned out right or you didn't have a good relationship with your daddy or your mommy or your grandpa or kids in the neighborhood and didn't like you because you weren't cool or, you know, maybe you haven't excelled up the corporate ladder like you were hoping. Friend, whatever gifts you have, God gave them to you so that you may Bless God by turning those gifts back to him and becoming a worshiper of our Heavenly Father. For God, our Heavenly Father, seeks worshipers. But he gives you gifts, and you have a gift, whatever it is. Whether you're big and strong, small, tiny, in a wheelchair, paraplegic, whatever you are, you have gifts. And in your mind, or in your tongue, or in your life, your gifts were given to you to praise and adore our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. When you fulfill that role, you will find eternity is waiting for you with multiple, multiple, multiple blessings that will last forever. God bless you, friends. See you next time.